All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're just a few minutes after the hour. Uh, thank you all for uh, for coming. Uh, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Village of Hastings on Hudson. My name is Chris Nidal. I'll be your moderator today uh, for the next hour or so. Uh, we're excited to bring this webinar, which will focus on a recent resolution that was passed by the Village of Hastings just last month that will focus um, uh, the town's efforts on reducing the climate impact of concrete uh, within the village. And uh, so what we wanna do today is we wanna uh, give you a little bit of background on this resolution, uh, what the motivation for it was, and the types of specific policies or actions that this resolution we hope will give rise to, some of which are underway. And for those of you who have not been fortunate enough to visit the, uh, the lovely uh, village of Hastings on Hudson, it's located in Westchester County, just about 20 miles uh, north of Midtown Manhattan, population uh, 8,000. It is part of, and I know that uh, many people who are, who are uh, tuning in today are part of the New York State Climate Smart Community Network. Hastings on Hudson is a registered uh, Climate Smart Community here in New York. Uh, and it's also one of 40 something some odd bronze uh, certified communities. And shortly it's, it's on its way to being one of only four silver communities in the state. So what we're going to do today is we'd like to first just give a ground and we understand that many people, myself, I, I actually come from a renewable energy background. A year ago, I didn't know the difference between concrete and cement. So we understand that a lot of folks now understand um, those who are interested in reducing climate impact for the communities. They understand that concrete is, is a piece of the pie, but don't quite understand how. So what we want to do uh, sort of in a 101 type of way is to give uh, our attendees sort of a grounding in why it is that concrete really matters to climate and what are the types of solutions or pathways that local governments can look at to reduce the carbon impact of the concrete within their jurisdiction. And then what I also really want to do is cap off the presentation by, by really stressing how important local governments are to driving the adoption uh, of low carbon concrete. I think that they really have a special role to play uh, which the Hastings resolution itself is evidence of, but you can look all around North America and the world and see that local governments are really driving a lot of the, the action on uh, advancing low carbon concrete. And the second part uh, of, of today's webinar is going to focus on, uh, it's actually gonna be a discussion. I'll be happy to bring in uh, Mayor uh, Nikki Armacost, uh, the mayor of Hastings, along with a couple members of her uh, board of trustees and here we're going to talk about the background of the resolution, what motivated it, and what we hope will actually come out of this resolution in terms of uh, concrete or tangible uh, actions. And then we'll open up uh, for a Q&A. The way that we're going to run the Q&A is going to be um, as, uh, as you can you go ahead and use the chat or the Q&A function you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom. Go ahead and type your questions in, and you can start typing those at any point, and then we'll go ahead and we'll turn to those and we'll take those uh, after the discussion. We'll go ahead and take it from there, but what I'd like to first do is give uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Armacost uh, an opportunity to uh, welcome us all and, uh, and, and kick off today's webinar. Mayor Armacost? Thanks. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar about low embodied carbon concrete. Um, it's very exciting for us to have Hastings featured uh, at this webinar and really very special Thanks to Chris Nidal and the Open Air Collective for putting this together. We wouldn't have been able to do it without you. I'm really looking forward to hearing your presentation, Chris, and hopefully answering your questions in a way that uh, provides some insight for others who are listening, both municipal leaders as well as others in the community. So back to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Mayor Armacost. I appreciate it. And I'll give some more information on the Open Air Collective. Uh, we are a uh, New York, but increasingly global-based volunteer uh, network uh, that's focused on advancing uh, negative emissions technologies through smart local policy uh, and uh, R&D projects. And I'll give you some more information about that uh, towards the end of the call. So just going ahead and, and moving along here with our presentation. Oops. Why concrete matters to climate? Again, what I really want to do is just sort of ground us understanding that many people are interested in the subject but might be starting from square one. So here I do want to get into what are the, uh, what are the main reasons why uh, concrete is relevant to the climate discussion and what are ways that we can address that uh, locally. And I think as a way into this topic, what was helpful for me 
over the last several months, or there's kind of two big ideas that I think um, are helpful to wrap our heads around when we think about concrete and climate. The first is this term that you might have heard about more recently called embodied carbon. It's a concept that's been around for quite some time, uh, but it's really sort of been elevated in the last few years. And what this describes is, this is the, these are the emissions that are produced in the making of things. Uh, so in the manufacture, transportation, and construction of things, which we can contrast with operational carbon, which we usually think about maybe more when we're thinking about addressing climate change, and that's the utilization thing. So just to take the example of a building, the embodied carbon of a building comes from all the materials that are used and transported and constructed on site that all happen at once up front, and the operational carbon is the utilization of that building, the lights, the heaters, the elevators, et cetera. And it's important for us to now be thinking more about embodied carbon because it's a huge part of the pie when we think of what emissions are gonna look like for new construction going forward between now and 2050, a critical window of time for us to address climate change. In fact, it's gonna be about half, it's estimated according to Architecture 2030, of emissions are gonna be all invested in that embodied carbon. And just to give you a sense of the scale of that, we know that the built environment is a huge part of, of, of the, climate, uh, the climate pie, uh, but this is just going to increase over time. We're looking at, in that same time frame up to 2 trillion square feet uh, of new construction. That's about almost a New York City every month for 30, 35 years. So just to give you a sense of how enormous that is and how much embodied carbon we're talking about here. And as we know, that time frame isn't arbitrary. While we talk about 2050 a lot, is because this is a critical window of time. We've run out of time right now in terms of our carbon budget. If we want to stay under 1.5 degrees C, and that's in, we now know how important that is in terms of uh, average temperature change, we have to take drastic action. And that includes in the next decade, cutting almost our emissions almost by half, and then getting to net zero by 2050 uh, in order to avoid uh, irreversible uh, climate change. So again, if we're thinking about embodied carbon, that has to be a, a huge central part of the conversation um, that, we, that we're attending to. Another part which leads to the other big idea is that um, not only are we in a position that we have to radically reduce our emissions, we now know, uh, according to the UN IPCC, that there's no scenario in which we achieve that goal that also doesn't involve the removal of some carbon dioxide emissions that are already in the atmosphere, not just some, quite a substantial amount. So we now can't just mitigate or reduce our emissions, we now have to actively pull carbon out of the air. And this relates to this other exciting idea that is part of the concrete conversation, which is, which is sometimes called carbon positive construction, just to confuse everyone, sometimes it's called carbon negative construction, but what this really refers to, and this is a great quote from Bruce King, who's been a real pioneer in this space. When we're talking about carbon positive uh, construction, we're talking about, let's not just mitigate the negative impacts of the built environment. Let's try to make the built environment actually something that is a net good for the environment and for the climate. And that also includes um, not just reducing the emissions uh, from the built environment, embodied carbon and operational carbon, but also, can we turn the built environment into a net carbon sink, almost like a, a forest or a wetland that actually absorbs more carbon than it releases? And I think that that is a really important, uh, big aspiration for us to, 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 to grab onto. And what's exciting is, is that if you were to start anywhere, we have to do all these things at once, but if you were to start anywhere in terms of addressing embodied carbon and to start thinking about carbon positive construction, concrete is the place where you, where you want to start. Uh, why is this? It's because concrete is everywhere. It's almost like we're fish in the water and we lose sense of the water around us. It's the same with concrete. It's, it's, it's really what builds um, modern civilization. It's the second most used substance on earth after water. And currently we produce about 10 billion tons per year. And that's only going up and up and up uh, uh, over, over the next uh, coming decades. The other thing is it's here to stay as well, or at least within that meaningful time frame that we're talking about in which we really have to drastically reduce uh, emissions. And why is that? One is, and we cannot lose sight of this, is that it's an excellent building material. That is why it's so common. It is, it is unparalleled in not only its, its strength, durability, and, versus, uh, and resistance, but its versatility. You can do so many different things with concrete, whether you're talking about precast or ready mix, but even within that, just the amount of different 
uh, qualities structurally that can be affected with concrete or, or unparalleled. And there's often a, a metaphor when we talk about concrete, we talk about concrete makers as bakers, that they really, they have different recipes that they're able to generate to do different things. And that's a very apt metaphor. So it's an excellent building material, but it's also, because it's so excellent, it's been around for such a long time, it's so ingrained in all of the practices, standards, and codes of construction, architecture, and engineering. And so the task of even phasing it out, if we had another option, uh, would be incredibly uh, time consuming and complex, uh, given how central it is to the built environment. And then lastly, if we are going to actually, if that, those growth uh, statistics are, are true or projections, um, there's just really no other option uh, for materials that can really scale up uh, to meet that demand. And that's because concrete is made of very abundant and generally locally accessible materials. And talking about the materials of concrete is what really brings us closer to the subject of why does it matter to climate. Some people might be surprised to know it's, it's most of concrete by volume are made of sand and gravel, a uh, combination of which we call aggregate in, in concrete. Up to three quarters of the volume is mostly made out of these very common materials. The rest of it is a combination of water and what we call Portland cement. And Portland cement is really the, the magic powder uh, that is the, the glue or the binding agent that converts these very abundant materials into this special uh, special that allows concrete to be concrete and to have um, the characteristics that I just just mentioned. But, but cement is also really the, the sort of the central um, object, I guess you could say, it, to this question of why concrete matters to climate. So whereas it's 10 to 15 percent of the volume, the cement actually accounts for 85, 90 percent of the CO2 uh, emissions uh, for concrete, just that one ingredient. In fact, about one ton of cement production generates uh, about one ton of CO2, making it one of the most intensive uh, construction materials on the planet. Um, and when you scale that up, when we consider that 10 billion tons of concrete that we use, you can see where cement fits uh, pretty substantially into our, uh, all the different emission sources uh, that we have to mitigate over the next three decades. And within that, why is that, why is it, how could it be so carbon intensive? What's the cause of that? A lot of that focuses on this material that's at the center of concrete. It's essentially almost like the eggs in the, in the, in the, in the cake, which is the clinker. And this is a, a key ingredient that, um, that, uh, that, that helps with the binding of, of cement. Um, and clinker is basically comes from limestone, another massively abundant material on the planet. And to make clinker, you have to put it in a rotary kiln and heat it up to massively high temperatures, 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. And to get that kind of heat, really, you have to do that with energy dense fuels like fossil fuels, coal, uh, oil, and, and gas. So just the heating of it alone is an enormous amount of carbon emissions that come from that. But the even bigger part actually is the chemical reaction that occurs when you break down limestone to make a clinker, a process called calcination, which re releases an enormous amount uh, of CO2 in the process. And here, just to show you the kind of life cycle here, uh, or the different stages of cement production, you can see there in the middle how much of it on this bottom here comes from that calcination and the fossil fuels used to heat up the limestone. It's the vast majority, about 85-90% of the cement process. So moving on to, when we, when we talk about decarbonizing concrete, it should be clear that we're really talking about decarbonizing uh, cement. Um, and so what I wanna do is give you a bit of a landscape of what those different, as we call decarbonization pathways uh, that are available that we can consider uh, in the present and in the near future. And there's kind of generally three different buckets. Uh, this could be some of the folks that are uh, listening in right now that come from concrete and construction say, no, there's 10 buckets. But for the purposes of introducing to the subject, I'll break it down uh, into three. One, which is really more of a supply side thing on the cement side, is um, it really matters how efficient in the type of fuel that a cement factory uses. So this is this kiln, the rotary kiln. Um, the more efficient a plant is, obviously, the less energy it takes to, to run, the lower its emissions it's going to be. And similarly, it, the fuel type. Um, you know, right now, co coal globally is very common, but other fossil fuels can also be used. And ultimately, we could be looking at biofuels being used for this, which would obviously reduce the carbon profile, as well as in the future, potentially hydrogen which would have a big impact. And here you can see already, if you just look at the major cement, cement also is a global commodity. It's produced all over the world and shipped over the world. 
you can see by this, this chart here that there's uh, quite a bit of spread in terms of the, the carbon intensity here on the bottom relative to output among the major providers. So there's already uh, quite, a, quite a bit of difference in terms of the carbon footprint of different, different cements coming from different places. The other one, which is really probably the most you can think of as the most actionable right now and the most important is just the utilization of less Portland cement. And there's a few different ways in which this can be done. One is actually happens at the cement plant and is being advocated by some of the leading cement uh, companies in the world. Um, and this is to use what's called Portland limestone cement. And that means instead of using the full clinker dose, you can actually mix the clinker with ground up limestone. Uh, and that, that reduces the amount of clinker that you have to use and you can still have mostly the same structural characteristics. So that right there would just create a type of cement that's less carbon intensive. And that's something that can be done uh, immediately. Um, the other is, a, is, a, is an area what we call supplementary cementaceous materials or S, uh, SCMs, okay? And this is basically material that you add to the concrete that substitutes for cement. It reduces the amount of cement that you have to put in. Some of these um, are uh, widely available already. These have been on the market for a long time and they're well known and they actually come from waste materials from other industrial processes such as slag, which is created from steel and iron production and fly ash, which is produced from coal production. So these waste materials can actually be added to reduce the amount of cement that's required. There are other SCMs as well. One that I'm particularly fascinated with, and there's actually a local company just in New Rochelle, not too far from, uh, from Hastings uh, called Urban Mining Northeast that produces what's called ground glass pozzolan. We produce a lot of glass waste, much of which cannot be recycled. Um, you can actually grind up glass, uh, ground glass uh, locally into a pozzolan or fine powder, and that can also be used as an SCM. So that's a really, uh, really promising uh, emerging technology that is available on the market right now. And then the last part is um, really just using less cement. Um, there's generally acknowledged that the, the standards, specification standards that are established, which are quite conservative, um, they require... Or, uh, more cement than is probably necessary in order to, that is definitely necessary in order to meet the structural needs uh, of most cement uses. So in a lot of cases, what we need to do is we need to just be reducing the amount of uh, cement uh, that, we, that we use in different, different mixes. And then the last part I want to talk about, which is something that my group, the Open Air Collective, is, is that this was sort of our way into concrete, uh, is, is what's called carbon capture utilization and storage, or CCUS. And this is important because, again, if we go back to the, the carbon profile of cement, you see that there's fossil fuels, which are difficult to substitute because of the amount of heat that's required uh, um, in the short term. And then this calcination process, there's just a carbon intensity that's baked into the cake of cement. Um, and so that's difficult to substitute away uh, with an alternative. So that means that we're going to have to start um, capturing carbon dioxide and utilizing carbon dioxide as part of the ways of decarbonizing cement. And this is widely accepted now, is that a large part, in fact, of our decarbonizing cement and concrete is going to have to come from solutions that do this, that capture carbon either at plants or even from the air or from other sources and put them somewhere to offset that incredible carbon intensity of the heat and calcination process. This is another uh, report uh, from McKinsey from last month that just sort of shows how new technologies, which the footnote more or less is specifying carbon capture and utilization, how much uh, of the overall carbon reduction is going to have to come from those technologies over the next three years compared to alternate fuels and SEMs, et cetera. And this actually also is exciting because it relates us back to that other big idea that I introduced at the beginning of the conversation, around carbon positive construction. So concrete that we've been using all along actually has already a property where it absorbs carbon over time. It, it just does that naturally. Uh, it actually is a sort of gradual sponge for carbon. But new technologies uh, and new products and processes can actually supersize that uh, sort of natural latent tendency of concrete and front end it. So we can actually conceivably put a lot of carbon dioxide uh, over time in carbon and that can really be the key to unlocking a truly carbon positive or even carbon negative uh, concrete uh, in the future. 
Uh, so just in terms of what, what are the different types of categories we can look at? One we, we call carbon curing, which is well established right now. There are companies that, that uh, are already providing this. Uh, what carbon curing is where you take carbon dioxide and you inject it uh, into the concrete manufacturing process. That both strengthens the concrete, but it also reduces the need for cement as well. So there's sort of a double whammy in terms of the carbon impact. Two companies, if anybody, if you've explored this, subject at all you've encountered. Uh, Carbon Cure, a Canadian-based company, has uh, its plant-based technologies deployed uh, all over uh, North America at this point. And Solidia right here uh, in, uh, in New Jersey uh, as well is, is, is active um, uh, in this space as well. Um, another is exciting, which is more of an emerging technology, which we want to see uh, accelerate uh, in, in the next couple of years. And that's what we can call carbon-based components. So can we make concrete actually uh, out of things that are made out of carbon that either come from industrial smokestacks or from the air itself. And some examples of this, kind of the holy grail when we think about that is, could we actually start to incorporate carbon into aggregate? Which the reason why that's significant again is because aggregate is most of concrete. So given the volumes of concrete that we pour, if you could start making some of that stuff out of carbon dioxide, there you're talking about removing or storing or stabilizing enormous amounts of carbon globally over time. Two companies that are notable in this area, Blue Planet based in California, Carbonate based in the UK. What they do is they create uh, materials that actually can be incorporated or that can coat aggregate that are made out of carbon dioxide, both from an industrial and from air-based sources. And then another one which I, I'm, I'm really excited about is Carbon Upcycling. It's a company that's based in Calgary and they actually um, produce a, a powder that uh, is produced from the, the chemical absorption of CO2, either from industrial or from air sources. And that powder actually can be ground up and it can be used in all sorts of different ways, including as coatings for different forms of concrete. And it can also sort of, again, sort of supersize fly ash. You can take fly ash and mix it in this material so that it even has more carbon. What's exciting about this company, which is a young company based in Calgary, but they recently actually won a grant from NYSERDA to set up shop in the southern tier of New York State, which hopefully um, will, will happen soon. So we're excited about having our own local uh, carbon tech or uh, uh, carbon concrete company uh, here in New York State. And then the last part, which, which could conceivably potentially have the biggest impact over time, is can we start capturing uh, CO2 right at the cement plant so that it can be used for other industrial purposes or stored geologically. There are a few different projects that are happening in this domain. One that's exciting is a Canadian company, uh, Spante, um, which does exactly that. And, and I know of at least one uh, pilot that it's running with Lafarge Holcim, which is the largest cement uh, manufacturer in the world, one of the largest construction companies in the world, uh, materials companies in the world, uh, that also runs the, the biggest uh, uh, cement uh, manufacturing plant here in New York State as well, just south of Albany and Ravina. So this is a, a promising project, uh, which is one of several, uh, which we hope to see more of in the coming years. So this is the general kind of portfolio we could look at of different options. I do want to make one note, though, also on transportation. Transportation matters. Cement, as I said, is a global uh, commodity that can be shipped in from all over the place. So it does affect the, the, the carbon profile of concrete, of where that cement comes from, not just in terms of the efficiency of the plant, but where it also comes from. There's also some interesting companies that are looking at uh, how do we reduce the carbon from transporting concrete from sites uh, to, uh, uh, rather from plants to sites. Uh, one that's very interesting at a very early stage is called OSL. They're actually looking at ship-based uh, concrete production that would allow ships to come to major cities, produce clean concrete, and then pipe it into the city to reduce uh, transportation. So very exciting company. But one thing that kind of leads into the last subject that I wanted to talk about before we started our discussion is that concrete is kind of an inherently local thing. The actual production of concrete, concrete because of it's, it's wet, it actually has to be located usually within 50 miles of the site. So the concrete industry is largely these are small to moderate sized business, some that are owned by larger, uh, larger companies, but they're, they're local, they're, par they're part of our community. Um, there's, oh, oh, I think, over 200 concrete plants and uh, concrete component manufacturers in New York State alone. Um, and that's important when we think about local government, which I'll explain in a second. Before I do that, some of you might be asking, okay, these are all interesting, but if I look at a, 
at, at a, a bucket of concrete, how do I know if it has any of those things in it? And what do I do as a local government potentially uh, to make sure that there's more of it in my community? Um, this is something we'll get into in a future webinar, but I just wanna kind of set it out there. There's different ways, generally speaking, you can divide it in two that any purchaser of concrete can try to order or incorporate low carbon options. One is specification based. Um, you know, towns and local governments can look at the available low carbon concrete options, let's say SCMs like ground glass porcelain um, or cement reduction, and they can specify those specific actions um, in their RFP process. Another, which really I think represents sort of the state of the art and a paradigm that we really wanna to move towards is, and it's also easier for the, for the, the buyer, is more of a life cycle analysis based uh, um, uh, method. And here we're talking about um, what the most conventional tool or what are called environmental product declarations, which are essentially nutrition labels for products. And, and you can use it for concrete as well, which take into account, the, it's, it's based on a, a life cycle analysis that counts the carbon from the beginning all the way through the manufacturing process and then assigns numbers to it, almost like calories or carbohydrates or fat. It's almost exactly like a nutrition label. Uh, and one of the key ones is this global warming potential, uh, which you can see. So here from a procurement standpoint, if you have uh, concrete providers that have these EPDs attached to their, um, to their product, you can look at the numbers and compare them and make a choice on that basis. And so one of the tasks that we have ahead of us is to really try to advance, accelerate the adoption of these EPDs. Okay, now I would just wanna close before we just start a discussion is again, sometimes, this is certainly not my uh, experience as someone who's worked in solar, we think of local government as small and that small might be uh, incidental to the big giant global climate questions. That is not the case at all, and it's particularly not the case with concrete, because I think local government is really where the rubber meets the road, and there's a lot of, as I, I think of as sort of superpowers or sort of qualities that local government has, towns, municipalities, villages, counties, that can uh, really drive uh, advancement of low carbon. One is towns, lo local governments procure concrete. Um, so uh, that's just, just their market power alone. They can begin as early adopters to start to really explore this and purchase uh, concrete, low carbon concrete for their projects. The other though, that's really important, which we've, we've observed is local governments are really at the tip of the knife here when it comes to policy innovation. They're the ones, if you look nationally and throughout North America that are really driving interesting policies to spur adoption of low embodied carbon concrete. Just to give you a few notable examples, Marin County, um, late last year, introduced the first low carbon concrete building code uh, in the country, which now any other jurisdiction can look at and build on, incredibly important. The city of Portland now requires concrete pro uh, providers to provide EPDs, those EPDs that I showed, uh, with any, in any RFP so that they can be compared by the city. Um, Honolulu um, introduced um, a resolution in support of carbon mineralized concrete. That's like carbon cured concrete. And that resolution was actually adopted by the US Conference of Mayors, which is all cities over 30,000 people uh, at their last annual meeting in Honolulu last year. So this just shows you a couple of examples among many of local governments really taking the lead. And that lead can influence higher levels of government. Um, if we started to get real traction for low carbon concrete here in New York, that would no doubt influence the state of New York to follow, seat, follow the lead of local governments. And right now we actually have legislation that's been introduced in the assembly that would require the New York state to procure low carbon concrete. Um, and certainly if local governments around the state are taking the lead, learning and advancing this, that will only help build momentum for legislation like this in Albany. And certainly local governments also play an incredibly important role as conveners and as educators. So if, if the town of Hastings moves forward with its uh, low carbon uh, strategy, um, it has the ability to educate not only local builders, but also local concrete makers, architects, and engineers um, to start to build up awareness and familiarity and comfort. And then finally, this is the really, really exciting part, I think, is that local governments can and often do work together. They work in networks. There's many problems that they need to solve together, including responses to climate change. So local governments can, um, when, when a town like Hastings or village like Hastings introduces this type of policy, um, you can 
other towns can look at it and adopt it as well and add to it. Um, there's, the, there's the learnings that can be exchanged uh, throughout uh, the network of different local governments that are working together in concert. And just to end on that, I would just want to just take the example of, you know, New York State Climate Smart Communities if you're from out of state and you're not familiar with it. It's just a wonderful program that the state implemented over a decade ago, almost operates kind of like a lead program for communities that specifies specific actions that communities can take to reduce their, uh, their climate impact. And based on their performance of those, they can get different levels of, of certification for it. Right now, there's over 300 registered communities in that network. That's over almost 9 million people that live in those jurisdictions. And you can start to see some of the clusterings here, just in the Hudson Valley there, Long Island, around central New York and uh, Tompkins County, which always overperforms in climate stuff, has been a real um, pocket of innovation in, in climate action. You could start to see towns there thinking about this together and uh, basically accumulating their knowledge and even their purchasing power to make a really big impact. Uh, and then if you think about that as well, as I said before, is that concrete is a local industry interspersed throughout the state in our communities are concrete companies that if there's demand for low carbon concrete products, uh, they will deliver. And so there's a real opportunity here for uh, these uh, local governments, not only to collaborate with each other, but to also bring in concrete, local concrete companies into the fold to have that dialogue and conversation to move things forward. All right, so with that, I hope that wasn't too long. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and hear directly from Mayor Armacost and a couple members of her board of trustees, as well as uh, one of the members of her climate uh, smart communities task force. Uh, Mayor Armacost, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I certainly can. Great. Fantastic. I'm gonna stop sharing here. All right, great. And I'll go ahead and uh, introduce uh, who's joining you. Let me turn that part off. Not sure what you can see. Uh, we also have uh, Ian Semenides, who is a Hastings resident, and he's been a very active member of the Climate Smart Communities Task Force that Mayor Armacost set up and has done a lot of the, the research and legwork on this initiative. And we also have Morgan Flasig, who is a uh, member of the Board of Trustees, as well as a registered architect. Uh, and so what we'll do is we'll, we'll hear a little bit from Mayor Armacost and her colleagues right now about uh, what the experience was. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Mayor Armacost, if we could just, let's place this subject of, of concrete um, into the, the wider effort that Hastings is making here. I know that you've been a climate smart community for 10 years. Obviously you're at the top of the stack in terms of your certification. Paint us a picture a little bit of what, what else you're doing uh, to address climate change in Hastings. Well, first of all, I, I want to say that the New York Climate Smart Communities Program has been really fantastic for us as a village. It's enabled us to prioritize policies and programs that have had multiple benefits for our environment and our economy. There are about 100 predetermined actions that have been developed by the New York State DC that provide a transformational roadmap for, for municipalities like ours. So under the CSC program, we've committed to transitioning to zero carbon emissions, investing in community resilience, restoring ecosystems, building a more just, healthy and livable future and doing our part within the region on climate mitigation adaptation. So which all sounds really fantastic. Um, and until September 2019, when we established our Climate Smart Communities Task Force, we had been doing a range of actions that fitted under that CSC rubric, but we hadn't really documented those actions or been very strategic about advancement. So creating the task force really enabled us to accelerate documentation of what we've done and plan a broad suite of new initiatives to ensure a climate resistant environment for the future. Some of the more recent actions include adopting the New York Stretch Energy Code. We're one of the first municipalities in New York State to adopt a code and the first in Westchester County. We're very proud of that. Um, we also passed a local law to establish a sustainable loan program uh, for um, allowing qualified property owners to receive low cost long-term dedicated financing for the installation of clean energy programs and of course we passed a resolution committing the local government to promote the use of low embodied carbon products 
in building and infrastructures in the village, which is the subject of this webinar. Um, and this week, we're in the process of submitting documents to secure CSC silver status. So wish us luck in that. <laughs> Best of luck on that. So given the enormous amount of activity that you're already engaged in around climate, can you tell us a little bit about how concrete uh, got on your radar? Obviously, you're looking at embodied carbon already, but go ahead and tell us a story about how concrete became a priority. So, so a few years ago, I was invited to the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Summit in Manhattan. Um, Ethan Zindler, head of the Americas, is a friend of mine from my day job. And uh, for those of you who haven't been to that conference, though it's incredibly interesting. There's always a really, really amazing group of speakers because BNF, BNEF sleuths out some of the most innovative companies and speakers around. One of them was Rob Niven of Carbon Cure. And I found, I mean, this was a few years ago, I found the concepts he was discussing quite fascinating and had made a mental note at that time that this kind of technology might be really interesting at the municipal level. I was a trustee back then. The next time Green Concrete came up was when you and I did one of our biannual chats, Chris. <laughs> um, uh, we catch up periodically twice a year. And you know, you had mentioned that this topic was interesting to you. And then in January, you told me about the work you were doing with the Open Air Collective. And particularly the work you were doing on uh, pursuing bills at the New York City level and at the state level on procurement. And the rest is history. Um, that idea sparked a set of conversations here um, that, that uh, led to us uh, passing this resolution. I think we'll talk a little bit more about them uh, in a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and about resolutions, you know, resolutions are sort of statements of principle. They don't carry with them uh, sort of specific policy prescriptions, but they're important. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, why a resolution first? What is, it, what is it sort of the significance of a resolution for local government? So my view is that resolutions are a great way to raise awareness and get people thinking. Uh, one of the key roles of government, however small, um, is to create a conducive environment for innovations to flourish. And to do that, we as the municipality need to provide information that people can understand, um, new ideas and concepts about how they might be implemented. And what this resolution does is it explains that the simple act of switching to low embodied carbon concrete can make a radical difference in lowering carbon, carbon emissions. It explains what low embodied concrete is, carbon concrete is, and it encourages the use of low embodied carbon concrete in our village and beyond. So it kind of sets the stage. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of step in the direction of creating a local law or uh, changing a building code or or actually engaging in product projects uh, implementing projects later on and we'd seen um, resolutions from other municipalities Austin Texas comes to mind Honolulu Hawaii uh, which were all super and which we used as models but they struck me as a bit limited in scope as they only applied to municipal infrastructure projects and we wanted the scope to be wider which is why our resolution applies to building and infrastructure projects that might occur in the, build, in the village, any building, any building or infrastructure project. So we, we kind of widen the scope. And that's one of the things that you can do with the resolution. You can take what another municipality has done and build on it to create something that makes sense for you or that kind of pushes the envelope in a new way. Great. And, and the other thing I like about it is that it, it's broad in terms of low carbon concrete. It doesn't just specify carbon mineralized concrete or SCMs. It, it takes into account any of those options that I discussed before as they emerge on the market, which I think is a real strength of it. And I'd like to kind of talk about what we think this will mean in terms of what it gives rise to in terms of uh, concrete, can't avoid concrete uh, metaphors or uh, puns uh, when you talk about this, what it's, what it's going to do next. But before we do that, can you just give us a picture of what actually happened? Uh, you were interested in it. We had some conversations, but how does a reso resolution like this get passed? What's entailed in terms of education and awareness just to get to that step, at least in the Hastings case? 
well, you have to have a certain set of preconditions. So, so first of all, we are incredibly lucky with our board of trustees and our cadre of volunteers in the village. We have a really smart and engaged group of residents who are actively involved in sustainability and climate change issues. So that having that as the stage really, really helps. Um, but in this case, there was really quite a lot of luck involved uh, and it played a major role. And actually, I think it was you who pointed out to me that we had um, a colleague of yours from the Open Air Collective who is on the panel, Ion Simonides, and that he had grown up in Hastings and recently moved back to Hastings, which was, I mean, amazingly serendipitous for us. Um, and so you put us in touch with him. Uh, after speaking to Eon for even, I think, just five minutes, I realized that we had a little gold mine uh, in, in his person. And so we decided to include him um, as part of our Climate Smart Communities Task Force, where he has played a very important role, not just on this particular resolution, where he really did play a, a key role, but also on developing our natural resources inventory, uh, on the climate vulnerability assessment, um, and he is involved, I just found out that he's a, an honorary member of our Green Building Code team now and is involved in updating that specifically with relation to low embodied carbon concrete. So, um, so, so there's, there's a little bit of, of uh, uh, luck and there's a little bit of kind of pre-existing conditions that all created this together. I mean, it would actually be great to hear from, from Eon the, the process he went through in pulling the, the text of the resolution together. And, and then we can also talk to Morgan about the way in which it passed at the Board of Trustees level. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Mayor Armacost, uh, for those kind words. And, and um, to speak to sort of the process, it was really starting with what exists. So as you mentioned, there were the resolutions in Austin, Texas, there was the resolution in Hawaii, and also the resolution adopted by the Congress of, of Mayors. And those were really the, the sort of foundation uh, for the resolution, but then it was also a matter of looking at where, how low carbon concrete was being implemented in other part of the country. So first it was the resolutions that I looked at, but then I looked at Marin County to say, okay, that's a possibility. I looked at what uh, Oregon and Portland had been doing, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and that, those, so those were examples, and that gave sort of the concept for the resolution of the language that we wanted to include, the broadness that we wanted it to have, and the applicability of real all really all low carbon concrete products. Um, and so that was where a lot of it came from. And, and you know, the resolutions that pre previously existed give a lot of the language, and that was really, really helpful. But then in speaking with you and in speaking with Chris about sort of what we wanted the Hastings resolution to be and how we wanted it to be a little different, we sort of morphed it into being perfect for, for our community and for Hastings. And I think the, the really great thing about it is that it's very replicable. Any community that's the size of Hastings or even bigger could take the resolution that we wrote and do a similar thing and take it in and apply it to their, to their community. That's great. And I am actually interested in, in Trustee uh, Flasick and Morgan. Morgan, if you could, I know you're, you're an architect, obviously, and you're, you're very much dialed into climate and uh, low carbon construction. So from that perspective as a trustee, I'm just curious about uh, if you have any, any sort of words to share about your, uh, your take on this. Uh, yes, thank you, Christopher. Um, and thank you for your presentation. It was, it was excellent. Um, I honestly, uh, you know, I've been an architect. I actually started studying architecture in the early 80s. And, you know, at that time, we focused mostly on, you know, what an amazing material is, but but we weren't really talking about carbon sequestration or mitigation at all at that time. And, um, you know, I've been practicing now for um, a quarter of a century. And, you know, construction is necessarily a fairly conservative industry. I mean, it, you know, you don't want buildings falling down around you. People spend probably the largest expenditure um, in their lives will be on their house or their, you know, their office building, if, if they're a company. It's, it's always a very large uh, expenditure. And I, 
will admit, you know, I actually joined the Board of Trustees focused primarily on zoning as a tool for making change. And it was really the mayor that convinced me that we could also make an important change um, at a municipal level uh, with energy use as well. And uh, it, it really became clear to me as I got involved in local government just how important these smaller municipal actions are for giving uh, leaders at the, the state and federal level the ammunition they need to implement the changes that will help industry uh, focus their energies in the right direction. Excellent. And, and so now in terms of talking about how the, what does this mean for Hastings? I, I mean, even when you were thinking about the resolution, there was already some other specific projects that you had in mind to kind of start to materialize with the, with the um, resolution we're shooting for. Can you tell us a little bit about what is what are the next steps, I guess, or what, 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 what are you exploring right now in terms of low carbon concrete in Hastings? Uh, do you want to take that, Mayor, or would you like me? I mean, I, I can tell you one thing. I mean, Hastings is not known for a tremendous amount of construction. So I'm sure there are some people out there that are like, why is Hastings focused on, on this? But people do need to remember that we have a 42-acre parcel that's sitting in the river ready for development. We want it developed in the most responsible way um, for every stakeholder. And um, carbon, uh, low carbon construction is, is, is key to that development. So, you know, concrete obviously is, is one of the, the, the largest uh, carbon effectors in the building uh, material palette. But um, this is, I think this is the first of of many efforts on the village's part. Yeah, if I can just add in terms of what's next, um, uh, obviously the waterfront is a huge project that uh, will be coming down the pipeline for us, but there are lots of bread and butter issues which we deal with as a village that involve concrete, you know, like um, improvements to curbs and buildings. So. Uh, you know, we'll be making efforts to look at, at the resolution in all of those projects. And I just want to give a quick shout out to Trustee Mary Lambert, who is the board liaison with the Climate Smart Communities Task Force, and she's our sustainability point person. Um, Mary has a ta technology background and had, had worked for Google, and she found this idea of low embodied carbon concrete fascinating and was a big supporter of the resolution. She is incredibly organized and steadfast and will make sure that as we look at any project moving forward we take this resolution into account as will our um, amazing village manager who i think has a, a magic wand that just simply makes things happen when we we ask for it to move forward so between the two of them i think we'll be able to to get it into a number of other projects that uh, that move forward Excellent. Uh, Ian, I didn't know if you had anything to add to that. I know you've been pretty active in the fine details, but if not, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. There are a couple uh, projects that are, are more immediate that we're hoping to really incorporate the low carbon concrete into. Uh, one of them is that the Hillside Elementary School here in Hastings uh, is, has an addition that is uh, being planned to be built soon. And we spoke um, Thanks to the, the mayor, we got in touch with the architect for that project, uh, Ray Devell, who was very, very receptive to this initiative. Uh, when I spoke to him and I, I contacted him and we got in touch and he was kind enough and, and really sort of on our behalf brought this to the um, head contractors of the entire project and got them to incorporate low carbon concrete into the RPF. Uh, RFP, excuse me, uh, document. So it's in the bid document for the Hillside addition, for that addition to the public school, uh, which is great. It's a really, excuse the pun, concrete way to, uh, to incorporate the low carbon concrete into these, into these projects. And then another one, and, and this is very much in the beginning phases, and there's a lot of figuring out to do, um, but as you said, Chris, where, where the village uh, is doing an update on our green building code. And it's an opportunity for us to incorporate the low carbon concrete into that. We're figuring out how to do that. It's a bit of a challenge because we don't have a, a, a lot of local concrete producers that have EPDs, which is 
you know, the, the most trusted uh, way of really recognizing how much you were lowering the embodied carbon of a concrete mix. And so we're sort of trying to find proxy measures uh, and, and figure out a way that we can do this and certify low carbon concrete without an EPD. Um, but those, those, are, those are some of the ways that the village is looking to incorporate and use this resolution really now, you know, immediately. Excellent. And just looking at the, the clock here, there, there is one thing I would love to get into that kind of relates back to the end of my presentation, which is, I, I understand, uh, Mayor Armacost, obviously that the local uh, towns and villages and counties are in constant communication around a whole host of different things that have to be managed collectively. So I am interested in how you sort of see this as a um, something that could potentially spread uh, to other, like what, what, what potential do we have to potentially make the Hastings resolution uh, more common or well-known in other parts of the state? I think we have lots of opportunities. Um, the village is part of a number of consortia. So there's, there's one which is very local. Uh, it's the the, we call it the VOC, the Village Officials Committee, which includes mayors and village managers of our most immediate neighbors. And so what we do is we procure goods and services together uh, in order to reduce costs. So for example, we do re road surfacing projects together. We hire a pothole killer, which is an amazing vehicle, by the way, um, together um, and you know, so there's an opportunity there, for example, to do uh, curbing projects together. So that might be a potential opportunity. We're also part of Sustainable Westchester um, uh, and under the auspices of the county, we're participating in the Climate Action Plan um, Institute. Uh, Carla Castillo uh, is the Deputy Director of Clean Energy communities uh, for the Hudson Valley Regional Council, and she's working on that with Peter McCart, who is the Director of Energy Conservation and Sustainability for the Office of the Westchester County Executive. Maybe, maybe Peter can talk about, can, can join into the chat later. Um, but those kinds of consortia have many opportunities to collaborate on both policy change initiatives like adopting resolutions that are similar to ours as well as um, engaging in in uh, projects together so for example in uh, in the county we there's a shared services initiative so there could be theoretically a shared services uh, initiative around this and of course I mean I would love for uh, the climate smart communities to add uh, something, some kind of innovative action on this topic in the future. If there are any on the line, that's a personal plea from me. Um, and of course, at the national level, we are part of the Climate Mayors Alliance. We're part of the Global Covenant of Mayors. So there are potentially lots of opportunities to spread it both within the county, uh, regionally in New York, and then uh, uh, nationally and even theoretically internationally. So I think there are lots of opportunities there. That's great. And I actually, I think Peter McCart, who is the, um, he's the director of energy conservation and sustainability with Westchester County, you just talked about. Um, I wanted to give him an opportunity um, to join us for a second because I know that there are actually some uh, relevant uh, projects uh, in terms of this subject that, that is being pursued in other parts of Westchester. I also uh, do also want to mention uh, the village of, of Nyack, right across the river in Rockland County, is also uh, taking initiative on this front as well and is exploring low carbon concrete procurement uh, as well. Um, so just wanted to make sure, uh, just to also point out that there's probably people around the state that are looking at this in different ways. So it's important that we, we talk to each other and support each other. Um, Peter, again, if you're not available, oh, looks like you, we are. Peter, if you are, I uh, wanted to just quickly uh, provide some details about uh, some of the other projects in Westchester that are related. I see that you're on the panel, but you might be on mute. Let me unmute you. Again, I didn't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> okay. Well, it looks like Peter might be occupied. Um, but what, what I want to actually suggest here is, uh, unless there's anything else that the panel also wanted to uh, offer, um, you know, I think one of the things that is interesting to me is what is it that you most need now? You know, so I think it's, we're at the beginning of a process here, and I think it would be an enormous success 
is how does the Open Air Collective, how do other people on this call support each other to bring in the resources to solve the problem so that we can start to progress in this area. So if there's anything you wanna share that you think would be most helpful or some of the biggest questions that you have right now in order to have an effective resolution. So let me just start and then I'd love Ian and Morgan to chip in if they have more ideas. Um, for me now, what would be most useful is to have a set of resources aimed at the technicians who make the infrastructure projects happen. So the architects, the engineers, the developers, and of course the concrete manufacturers and others to help them understand the applicability of this resolution and others that might come up in NIAC or other places to their daily work. So if we think about this webinar as you know, low embodied carbon 101, as you mentioned early on, what we really need is a 201 and a 301. And, uh, and then um, the superpowers which you alluded to that we as municipalities have would really be able to properly flourish. Um, so uh, with that, Morgan and Eon uh, and Peter, if he's there, if, if there's anything else you want to add, it would be super to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to say that um, I, 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 I wanted to second what Mayor Armacost said and say that I, I think one of the best uh, ways forward and, and ways for resources to be shared is for there really to be a creation of relationships between municipalities and concrete producers. Uh, I think that's that in and of itself is an enormous resource because it gets the conversation going and you know oftentimes you can bring a resolution like this to a concrete producer and and they sort of take it as a challenge and they want to make the lowest carbon concrete for you that they can uh, and um, so I think bringing in that that conversation between the municipality the you know the, the procurers of the concrete the producers of the concrete and also bring in you know, those people that are manufacturing SEMs and have everyone come to a table and that's where the resources uh, can really be shared and, and how the idea of uh, the value of EPDs can be understood and slowly worked at. And, um, and it can also all build up in, in hopefully, I mean, you know, we're hoping that in Hastings this starts something and then our neighboring communities start to adopt it and then it sort of supports the state level bill from the bottom up. Um, so I think all of those are, are, would be helpful to spread the resources uh, uh, among communities and producers. That's great. And I think I just succeeded. Peter, are you, uh, are you there? I am here. Can you hear Excellent. me? Excellent. All right. Just in the nick of time. Uh, perfect segue, actually. Um, yeah, well, so, you know, we are a climate smart community as well as, as from the county. Um, and we are very, very close to getting our bronze. So uh, we like to follow uh, our, our wonderful municipalities like Hastings and a lot of the River Downs are, are very progressive and forward and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, I'm just gonna keep it real short to the, the, the subject at hand. Um, I, I'm glad that you brought up Urban Mining Northeast uh, who does do the puzzling, which is fantastic. We had them come in and give us a presentation. We've listened to other presentations from others. So it's really on our radar. Um, we have, as some of you may know, we have a, a uh, composting, uh, food scrap recycling, as we call it, uh, program that we are instituting. Uh, one part of it is uh, we're working with a hauler that's going to pick it up and aggregate it and, uh, at, at our cost. If you are in the district, which you are in the district, um, and the second part of that is a compost education center, and that is going to be built at the HMRF, at the, uh, the campus, um, we call it Grasslands, or right there in Valhalla. Um, and there is gonna be a need for concrete. So uh, uh, we've uh, asked the contractor that we are working with to uh, research it and look into it and, and utilize it. So there are not only just the concrete blocks, uh, but also the concrete pads where the, the compost, uh, the stages where the bays are gonna be. So we're looking at it. We wanna use that as a, as a pilot and a model. Um, I could go on and on about all the great initiatives we have going on and uh, people from uh, Hastings and uh, like I said, the River Towns have all been very supportive of everything we're doing here. But thank you for this. This is a great presentation. I'm looking forward to sharing this with some of our Board of Legislators who are probably on the call as well, but others. Uh, but thank you, Chris and, uh, and Mayor Amacost. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. Look forward to connecting with you and again, uh, building our collective efforts here. Uh, we, do, we did schedule this for 15 after the hour, so we do have some time for Q&A. One thing I want to say is there's a, a number of questions. First of all, I want to thank Mayor Armacost and the rest of the panel for your great work and your, your input. That was uh, very illuminating and just very exciting. 
Um, but I do want to um, kind of encapsulate some of the questions that have been asked. I want to say I uh, am not an engineer uh, and the panel is not as well. And a lot of these questions are highly technical. But one thing I want to say is that after this call, all of you have, who have registered uh, at the end of today or maybe tomorrow, depending on how quickly it's done, I'm going to send out an email with the link to the video of this presentation, plus the deck for this presentation and some other resources, but also a link to a forum that you can jump onto that we've started at Open Air Collective that's specifically focused on local initiatives uh, around low carbon concrete. And there you can ask some of these questions because within our network, we have some of the top authorities on low carbon concrete in, in the country. Um, so we can actually go very deep on some of these technical questions that you've asked about standards and performance. One question that, that, that comes up repeatedly here is the question of cost, which makes an enormous amount of sense. So what I want to point out, and I should have made more explicit in the presentation, is that a lot of those options that I mentioned are, are cost neutral. Uh, and they, they um, for instance, uh, utilizing yet less uh, cement uh, is really more of a, of a knowledge and standards types of, type, type of question and something that's been explored through the Marin County uh, project, among other things. Um, a lot of the SCMs as well, um, they actually have a positive cost impact as well as a positive performance impact. Again, we can go deeper on that in the forum, but some of the most available things are some of the things that actually have the least cost. But that does lead into it, and, and Nikki, if I could just have you respond one more time. You, you're conscious of that, obviously, in the resolution, and that is an element of the resolution where you need to protect the taxpayer and this, uh, the village budget uh, as well as uh, decarbonize its concrete. I didn't know if you want to speak to that at all. Yeah, that's obviously an important consideration. I mean, with any kind of procurement, you are, uh, most municipalities are looking for, um, for low, the lowest cost option or low cost options, unless there is something that allows for a choice, which is a more expensive option. But clearly, if the costs are lower for a municipality making the decision, that makes, uh, you know, a huge difference. And one of the things that we liked about the way that uh, Eon, I think with your help and the help of the Open Air Collective, crafted the resolution is that it allowed for more creativity around the definition. Um, and so it, it incorporated this idea of a low cost element, which we found quite useful. And, and I should just add that uh, Eon put together uh, a set of resources, some of which address this point as well as others that are up on our website. If people uh, would find that useful, we can also share that material. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, please I'll go share ahead, that Chris. with the, the email that we send out. I will absolutely include a okay. link to that. Um, another question that is related to cost that we got a few on here had to do with incentives. Uh, are there local incentives that the state of New York or that are offered? Um, you know, federally, um, not, not to my knowledge at this point. One of the things I did want to point out though, is that bill that I mentioned, the state bill that we hope to see passed in Albany, that's focused on um, a new standard for the state of New York and its various agencies to, uh, to uh, include climate impact in its procurement uh, uh, review. Um, but what it also does is it includes a tax credit actually for concrete manufacturers and concrete component manufacturers that helps them cover the upfront cost of those EPDs that I mentioned. Uh, again, EPDs, if we had more EPDs in the state of New York, it just allows for all kinds of different things in terms of how people can make decisions around construction. So that would have a ripple effect for anybody who wanted to do this anywhere. That would certainly help Mayor Armacost and Hastings if they wanted to implement an EPD-based program where they could just compare materials. That this tax credit would encourage their local concrete companies to go ahead and, 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 and do that. And that also is the same, which I should mention, for any institution or organization could also adopt a similar resolution and program, and they would certainly benefit uh, from a greater availability of EPDs. So that is one thing we're looking at in New York State, uh, but by all means, new ideas and new ways to think about how we can actually give rise to this in New York are important. So eager to hear more about that on the, on the panel. Um, just trying to see if there's any other questions here that aren't well of my pay grade as a non-engineer. Um, there, um, there are a lot of questions about the environmental downsides of SCMs. Um, if there is, uh, you know, mercury uh, that's involved. I, again, I wouldn't feel comfortable answering that right now, but 
I will get an answer for you on our forum if you want to ask it there. I promise you that I have enough. Patience. One thing I, I can comment to that, Chris, just from my research, is that the EPA does have federal guidelines for their concrete procurement that speak to SEM, specifically fly ash and, uh, and slag proportions in uh, low carbon concrete. So there are resources that exist that speak to, you know, allowable amounts of, of, of potentially uh, um, harmful materials in, in low carbon concretes. Okay, great. Well, what I'm gonna do then is again, um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and wrap up right now. There are a couple of things I would like, let me see if there's another question that just came in. Okay, no, let's just say a compliment to Mayor Armacost. <laughs> Um, so. there, there is one comment, Chris, Chris, which I noticed, which is, uh, um, can you talk about the state bill a little bit? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if you would like to do that, but um, I believe our assemblyman is an ally. So if you want to give a shout out to him, feel free to. Yes, yeah, uh, But there are a number of people in Westchester County who I think have been you know, Westchester County and obviously the state that have been allies in this. So it might be interesting for people. Absolutely. I could talk about that all day long. We have limited time here. Um, I will definitely, again, share information in the email, uh, a link that tells more about that. But we're excited about that uh, bill because it would really establish New York as really a national leader in promoting low carbon concrete. If you have the state of New York, which is a massive purchaser of concrete, making decisions around carbon, that is gonna have a huge ripple effect uh, across the whole supply chain for concrete and cement uh, here in New York State and the whole region. So it would be a really uh, big impact. And it just so happens that we have in the lower Hudson Valley some very influential, I wanna give Assemblymember Abinadi a shout out because he was one of the first co-sponsors of the bill. Um, but in the downstate lower Hudson Valley area, there happens to be a concentration of some very influential legislators a uh, number of them that are on the, the relevant committee right now that where the bill sits in the assembly, that's the government operations committee. There's three or four assembly members uh, just in the south of Poughkeepsie that are on that. And I'll, I'll send some information as well as the chair of the government operations committee, uh, Ken Zabrowski, who represents a large part of uh, Rockland County just across the river. So folks who are tuning in here from around the state uh, and certainly in the lower Hudson Valley would love to tell you more about that bill because I think it has a real chance and it meets a real need that the state of New York uh, is not yet addressing, and that's uh, emissions from cement and concrete. Um, so what I wanna do, again, I promise you that we can pick up these questions uh, on the forum. Uh, let me just quickly end here, if I may, uh, just with a couple of action items. Great, uh, just a few things here. Again, I'm gonna send out this email as soon as the video link is posted. Please do share the presentation. If you're a member of a Climate Smart community or whoever you may be, and you found this interesting and, and a word that you wanna spread, uh, please take the presentation and the video of this presentation and, and share it uh, with your colleagues and peers. Um, we'll also share that website page that uh, Eon and, and, and the trustees put together that includes the Hastings resolution itself. Uh, please share that, have those conversations uh, with your peers uh, in your local government. Um, this is going to include a link to the Open Air Collective's uh, forum in which we're gonna have a topic specifically about this subject, local government action uh, around uh, carbon concrete. Here you can ask any question that you might have about how to do this, uh, even the technical questions, and we can recruit from our broader network to answer those questions. So let's continue the conversation there. I'll send the link out uh, with that email. And then I wanna mention something that, that, that Mayor Armacost brought up. This is the beginning of a series of webinars that are gonna be hosted by the, the, the uh, Village of Hastings and the Open Air Collective that will go deeper into many of these subjects, very practically oriented to try to help lo local governments explore this. What we're gonna do in July, uh, and Eon is leading this effort, is we're drafting a low carbon procurement toolkit for local governments. So date TBD, but it'll be at about a month from now, we will have that webinar uh, in which we'll talk about procurement specifically. In August, we're gonna get into low carbon concrete building codes, which Hastings is pursuing. But they were going to bring in some of the experts that were involved in Marin County in California and elsewhere to really talk about steps and how you can do that. And then we have a number of other subjects that will probably come out uh, during the fall, some focused for local concrete producers around EPDs and low carbon, object, um, low carbon options. So if you have signed up for this uh, webinar and you're going to receive uh, an email 
uh, later on today or tomorrow morning, uh, you have the option of, of signing up to our mailing list and staying abreast of those, those webinars uh, as they come. But um, I think we have just hit our time and I really wanted to thank everybody for attending. Uh, really wanna thank again, Mayor Armacost and the Board of Trustees for your leadership uh, on this. And I'm very excited for those who have attended uh, to let's just look at this at the beginning and see how we can really uh, elevate and advance this here in New York State and beyond. Thank you. Great. Thank With you. that, everyone enjoy your morning. Thank you.